Oh my god, there's three of us! Oh my god, TikTok is hard. <laughs> LaChina, first of all, I want to just extend flowers to you because I feel like all of us are your children. Every, <laughs> every single one of us. Uh, we're going to get to your legacy, but the fact that you've been able to plant seed in so many different um, aspects of the game is just so special. I was watching a social clip the other day of somebody, and they were saying, who's the most famous person in your phone? And they were like, LaChina Robinson. <laughs> and then it was so interesting because they said, if you can call her up right now, will she answer? And the answer was yes. And you are always there to answer and just be there for us. And so I'm really, really thankful for you. So I just had to start off like that. Oh, well, thank you. Some of it comes with age. I'm just older than everybody. You just That's love that line. You love being like, I'm the old one. <laughs> I've been around, Girl. Okay? Like Tupac. But yeah, I um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Let's, let's, let's bring it back to when you first started. Uh, you were more like me than you think, right? A cheerleader. I was. So how did you end up in basketball? I was a reluctant basketball player, I'll be honest. I wanted to be a cheerleader because I was a socialite as a kid, at least I thought I was. Um, and all my friends were cheerleaders. So as a kid, you want to fit in. You want to do what everyone, everyone else is doing. Uh, but then when I was 14, I was 6'4". So, you know, there's this guy who kept coming around in my neighborhood. And he was like, are you sure you don't want to play basketball? He would ask my mom. And my mom is big on education. So sports, take it or leave it. But when he said I could get a free scholarship to college, my mom was like, we'll be there tomorrow. So that's <laughs> that's how my relationship with basketball started. And I actually loved it. And, and being that tall, there weren't a lot of places in the world where I felt like I fit. Mm -hmm. In the basketball court, I fit there. Like, I understood why I was tall. I had a purpose. I made friends and learned valuable life lessons. Did so. it come natural to you? Because it's one thing to say, hey, I'm, I want a scholarship. But you played in the ACC. You played for Wake Forest. That's a high D1. Yeah, no, I was terrible starting out. Okay, great. Um, when I was in the ninth grade, I was on freshman, and then I played JV, which is unprecedented, not in, not in a good way. Most D1 players play varsity their whole high school career, but that's how bad I was. Um, but I think the height definitely helped me in terms of the ACC level in Wake Forest in particular, feeling like I had potential. But then I just worked really hard to earn my spot in the starting lineup. I love what you said about getting your education for free. And Especially now, the student part of student athlete is becoming more challenging and you see it with NIL and you see it with just the fame that comes with playing the sport. What message do you have for student athletes out there and how to keep prioritizing education? The time goes fast. Uh, while it was the best four years of my life, it's the fastest four years of my life. And when I look back on it, I never felt like I had time to do anything but school and basketball. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, I was scared to death because my mother would threaten my life if my grades fell. So I was Period. dean's list the whole Love time. <laughs> <laughs> I was always dean's list. But um, at the end of the day, it, it goes really fast. So invest 110% in every aspect of what you're doing, whether that's on the court, as as, a, as a, a student in the classroom, but also get involved in things happening on campus. I thought I was so exhausted, like, oh, I'm so tired, I don't have time. But there were other aspects of, of growth as a person that I feel like I missed out on. Um, and I wish I would have pushed myself more in, in that way. But as far as basketball and school, I'm tapped out. I had nothing, <laughs> I had nothing left after my four years. So I, I would just say it goes fast and make the most of it in every way you can. I hate that you say you were tapped out because you want to claim oldness, but you ain't that old because the <laughs> WNBA was around when you were leaving college. So when did you know that that might not be a calling? <laughs> Fairly early. <laughs> um, like I said, I was a late bloomer. So I, I got better really fast. But to be honest with you, I was never that player that was shooting outside until the lights went off. Like, I just wasn't. I love to come in and compete, and that's what I was great at, was like, I wasn't going to let anyone beat me out in the starting lineup, for a rebound, in a sprint. So that's what kept me in the game, but I didn't have the work ethic mm. to reach the WNBA. And so when practice was over, I wanted to do other things. You know, I wanted to go get my nails done and hang out with my friends, and I loved music, and so... Um, I'm grateful for that balance. I think my mom helped me with that. But um, at the end of the day, you know, the WNBA just wasn't wasn't there for me because I hadn't put in that level of work. It's funny because I know Dierica, when she first got to Wake, she was nowhere near where she is today. And she worked really, really hard. She came in the locker room and said, I'm going to the WNBA. Yes. And worked every year. And so I love the self-awareness that you feel like, I just want to 
I just want to hang out with my girl. And it's not for everybody. And, yeah. and you know what? What is it? 99% of student women student athletes don't go pro. So it was a very small percentage. The WNBA, as you know, 144 players. Mm -hmm. Like, you really have to be elite. And I knew early on that it wasn't something that... I'm not going to say I never aspired to do, because I did want to be Lisa Leslie, but I just didn't have didn't we the all, drive. I right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just didn't have that level of work ethic that it took to separate myself. But you wanted to stay close to the game. So how were you able to stay close to the game post-graduation? Yeah, when I graduated, I had no idea what I was going to do. I went to the basketball office and was like, all right, guys, what are we doing next? And they're like, what are you doing here? Your career is You got over. your degree. Yeah, Get out. Like, we're done. Um, but I did want to stay close to the sport. So my first career before broadcasting was in athletic administration. Mm. Thought I wanted to be an athletics director. I worked at the ACC office as an intern for a year and then went to Georgia Tech, where I worked on their staff for about seven years. So um, that was my way of staying close to the game. But then when I was in my late 20s, I had like this quarter life crisis. Love it. And figured out that that's not what I wanted to do. And that's when I started to do some career exploration and, and ended up in broadcasting. You don't just like tumble, I mean, I guess you do tumble into broadcast, <laughs> but you, you have to prepare for it. And yeah. I know that you've been pouring into your mentees about it, but what are the keys to making that transition to not a broadcast role, not front-facing talent, to front-facing talent? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think one thing that helped me was that I was always in the women's basketball space. Mm -hmm. So not only was I a fan of the game going back to the 96 Olympic team, and even before that, I was watching, like, the Dawn Staley's at Virginia and the Kira Ors at Duke. Like, that was... I missed the little, the little curly bag right. Dawn. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> So I, I was literally a student of the game without knowing it. And I loved it and I enjoyed it. So that helped me when I was ready to make the transition because I knew the history of the game. I'd been watching it. And this is something that I would do for free. Like literally I'm sitting in my living room all the time telling teams what they should be doing and, and I can see commentating. Him. <laughs> right, <laughs> commentating what's happening. <laughs> So that, that, that helped, but it was also um, good for me that many of my contacts were in the women's basketball space mm -hmm. because of the work that I had done in athletic administration. I was super involved in a lot of professional development organizations when I was working in administration. So I was meeting people in NACWA and going to the Black Coaches Association. So I was making those contacts. And I did not realize, and this is one thing I, I would love for young people to know, you may not really understand how the things that you're doing now are going to get you where you mm. want to be, but it all adds up. And that's what it was for me. It was just the perfect storm of I loved the game, I'd been around it, I'd made the right contacts, and was willing to work really, really hard to get the experience that I did not have in broadcasting. Why women's basketball in particular? Why was that your choice and not just a stepping stone? Yeah, I appreciated the sport. It had inspired me throughout my entire life. Going back to the days of Pat Summit and watching her on television tell a reporter, we got to get more games on television and women's basketball deserves more support. And I had been inspired by Lisa Leslie. Like, I wanted to be her. Like, this was my vision for my entire life. And I knew how it had impacted me. So it was like, what if we can expose more young girls to this? Like, what if we can get more young women into sport where I learned to communicate and learned how to goal set and the importance of responsibility and role playing, all those things. Um, and so I just saw and really enjoyed the sport. That was first and foremost. But then as I started to dig, I realized where there wasn't a lot of equality when it came to what women's sports had versus men's sports. And I wanted to close that gap, whether that was in visibility, pay, just value in, in general, investment. Um, and so it, it went deeper than just, okay, this is a sport that I enjoy. It was, I can have an impact on how the world sees women. Mm -hmm. I can have an impact on the value of women. Um, and in particular, a sport that's predominantly black women and who look like me and, and deserve the visibility. So if I could move the needle at all when it comes to the visibility of the sport that had done so much for me, paying it forward, but also of women who deserve it, I, I wanted to do that. And you do move the needle. What is your responsibility when it comes to that portraying a league that's 80% black women, that has many queer people within it, that wh what is the responsibility that you inherit as a broadcaster, as a media member? 
to make sure that the audience, first and foremost, values the craft of these women. Like, this is 144 of the best players in the world, like best athletes in the world. So it's high level. And oftentimes, unfortunately, people look at, they turn on women's basketball and they see a woman playing a sport and they automatically say, oh, they're not good or they devalue it or they degrade it. Um, so I want to I wanna bring light to the fact that this is really good basketball. But then also it's an opportunity when you when you think about where women are, in particular women of color, in the macro view of this in the world, mm -hmm. they're invisible, they're voiceless, not given the opportunities they deserve, not paid equally. So already they're in the in the world, they're in a space where they're not valued like they should. So you bring that down to sport, and I'm saying to myself, what about if we do give them visibility? What mm. about if we do continue to get more opportunities for people to consume this product? What if we, you know, use our voices as our platforms to try to to drive um, investment in women's sports? Imagine how that impacts the world mm. when now a young girl can turn on the television and say, "Wow, like Neko Gumake is unbelievable!" Like now I have a vision of what I can be. We need more of that um, so that not only can we move the needle for women in sport, but in the world. And I really think that that sport is instrumental in doing that. I believe that sport can really transform in that way. And, and I want to be a part of that, like every day that I can. And Lasting you change. are, LaChina, and you have rising media stars. The, the philanthropy that you do is so important to the whole, the whole sphere of women in sports and women's sports. Why'd you start it? Why are you pointing at all of us? Why you answer the phone all the time? Why, how? How? How are you this superwoman? I was that young girl that had this dream of what I wanted to do, but was far from it. At least I felt that way. When I started in broadcasting, I had no experience, had never been on camera. I wasn't a communications major. But I was like, I need to make this pivot. And you were sociology, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I like the coursework. I had no idea what I was doing. But, <laughs> um, but there were women who were willing to open the door for me, to sit down with me, to um, help me with the resources and help me figure out ways to get reps in the broadcasting world. And I just wanted to return that favor for other young women, in particular women of color. Like, we need to diversify the face of sports broadcasting. Mm -hmm. We need to have more women in that space. We need to have more women of color in that space. So it's kind of like killing two birds with one stone, or should I say serving two passions in one. We can diversify sports broadcasting by preparing women of color, but also we can help these young women have a shot at their dream career. Um, so providing you know, that opportunity through this nonprofit, through Rising Media Stars, is, it means everything. And you are setting them up for a long career just like you've had. And so I have to know, LaChina, this is gonna be really hard, your favorite call that you've ever had in your career. Ooh, that's tough. You don't even have to be the favorite game. Favorite call that you've ever that's had. That's tough. Um, wow, that's a great question. I've, I've been a part of a lot of really, really great games and historical moments in our sport. And for that, I'm so grateful. But I would have to say, game five of the 2017 WNBA Finals, it was Minnesota versus LA, the last chapter in that rivalry, one of the greatest, if not the greatest we've had in, in league history. Um, at the barn in Minnesota, the crowd was like super loud, the loudest crowd I have ever uh, been a part of. And it, it was just, there was this energy in the building. It was high level basketball. The fans were going crazy. And I was like, this is what you want women's sports to be. This is what you want the WNBA to have, this spotlight. Like people were tuning in to this rivalry. They've been waiting and anticipating. You know, LA won the championship in 2016. This was Minnesota's opportunity to get back. So it was just this culmination of everything you could want in sport. And here I was front and center as someone who was, an underdog in broadcasting. I wasn't an Olympic gold medalist. I wasn't a, an NCAA champion. I, I didn't even play in the WNBA. And here I am front facing on this broadcast. And it was just one of the best moments of my career. But what do you see for the future of the WNBA? We've had the, the Houston Comets dynasty. We've had, you know, the WNBA prevail over the ABL. We've had Candace Parker making a full circle moment with the Pat Summit, you know, her death and then her being able to win the championship and then bringing it back to her hometown. We've had all these moments. Yeah. Where do you see the future of the WNBA? Uh, I see it continuing to grow. Um, I'm really excited, I'm sure you are, with the momentum we're seeing behind the sport, whether it's the monetary investment from brands and businesses or the viewership going through the roof. 
uh, players able to garner more brand deals and being in commercials and on magazine covers. Um, finally, this league is starting to get the treatment it deserves and the players are starting to get the treatment that, that they deserve. So my wish and my hope as far as the future is just continuing to have great basketball between the lines, um, hoping the league expands so more young women can live their dream, but just making the sport more accessible for everyone to be a part of. Um, you know this. We feel like a family in the WNBA, like everyone's welcome. There's a place for everybody. And so um, I just want more people to have access to what has been an amazing experience for me covering it as a fan. I'm sure you uh, could say the same. Um, so just hoping for continued growth. Well, thank you for being the catalyst of that growth. And I hope to uh, bring back the Charlotte Sting so you can be my I <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my sister. Thank you. You are amazing. I appreciate you, Queen. I love you.